Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the morning show. We're broadcasting on Channel 9, and we're also streaming on our Port Media's YouTube channel. Go to www.ncmhub.org and click on the YouTube icon in the upper right-hand corner. I am your host, Mary Jacobson, and I am so excited about today's show, I can hardly contain myself. I'm so honored and pleased to welcome today's guests. We're having Dr. Kate Clifford Larson here to talk about her fascinating, well-researched, and beautifully written biography of Harriet Tubman. And later in the show, I'll be welcoming local historian Jack Santos, who's going to talk about the 2020 pandemic version of If This House Could Talk. Barb Bailey of Newburyport Preservation Trust will also join us as will Sharon Spieldenner, who is the archivist at the New Report Public Library. But right now, let me introduce you all to Dr. Larson. She is the best-selling author of three critically acclaimed biographies, Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero, Rosemary, the Hidden Kennedy Daughter, and also the Assassin's Accomplice, Mary Surratt, and the Plot to Kill Abraham Lincoln. Kate has a BA and an MA from Simmons University and an MBA from Northeastern, and she also earned a doctorate in American history from the University of New Hampshire, specializing in 19th and 20th century U.S. women's and African American history. So welcome, Kate, and thank you so much for visiting us on The Morning Show. Well, thank you for having me, Mary. This is really great. Oh, it's it, totally my honor and my pleasure. I wanted to start, Kate, um, by asking you, what was it that drew you in the first place to focus on Harriet Tubman as a subject for your research and writing? Well, um, I decided to go back and get a degree in women's history at Simmons back in the early 1990s. And at the very same time, my daughter was in se second grade and she brought home a little biography of Harriet Tubman. And I, of course I knew Tubman, um, but I just became more fascinated by her with my daughter. And um, I had a couple of professors at Simmons. I was taking an African-American history course along with women's studies. And I, I, I just started looking for more books on Tubman. And the only mm -hmm. thing that was available were the two 19th century ones and then the one from 1943. And my professors could not believe that there was not a modern biography of Harriet Tubman at the time. So mm -hmm. that set me on a 10 year journey of research and writing about her. So the mission found you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is often the way in life. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I was so taken with the film Harriet, and it made me realize how little I knew about her and how much I should know about her. And then I was thrilled to find your book and then to find out you, you live in Winchester, you're nearby, and I could invite <laughs> you onto the morning show. I wanted to start out by asking you some things about um, her uh, work with the Underground Railroad. Now, Tubman escaped from slavery not just once. She went back to Maryland 13 times to rescue family and friends. And she'd been a slave. She knew the risks involved and the torment she'd have suffered if she were captured. So I was hoping that you could elaborate on the how and why of her multiple daring escapes. The how being the particular skills and the type of intelligence that enabled her to be so successful at eluding capture that many times. And the why being, what was it that motivated motivated her to take those substantial risks? Um, well, the why I'll answer right away. First of all, slavery and enslavement and the lack of freedom was a huge motivation. But the reason that she went back so many times was to rescue the people that she loved, mm. her family and closest friends. And I think that's something that we could all identify with. If we were in her shoes, who are we going to try to save? And those are the people mm -hmm. that we love the most. Mm -hmm. um, the how is incredible. First of all, she was a genius. She was a brilliant mm. human being, even though she didn't have um, literacy in the formal sense of being able to read and write. Um, she had tremendous literacy about the landscape, tremendous mm -hmm. literacy about people and how to navigate both um, social and uh, physical landscapes. Mm -hmm. And she learned a lot growing up as, a, as an enslaved person, how to protect herself, how to listen, how to pay attention, because if she didn't, she could be killed. And yeah. so she always had to be on watch. Mm -hmm. She also lived in an environment that um, was very much, uh, it, there were marshes and rivers and streams and and ports. And so she knew a lot of black watermen who were the fiber of communications for the African-American community throughout the Atlantic world. 
And um, so she knew how communication could be um, executed very easily through these mm. very trusted networks of black uh, mariners. They were called blackjacks. Uh. And her father taught her amazing survival skills in the woods and how to navigate quietly so you're not noticed or seen. So she put all those to good use on the uh, Underground Railroad. She certainly did. And she was just, I, I, what struck me when I was watching the film was the extraordinary amount of courage um, that she had. <laughs> and you make the point that that courage was tied to love yeah. um, because what was it, she knew what was at stake for the people that she was saving. Um, well, I also wanted to ask you about um, spirituality in Harriet Tubman's life because um, she seems to have had an almost uncanny ability to anticipate danger and hide just when she needed to. And I know um, in the movie, they make it clear and you tell the story in the book that she had had a head injury from a rock thrown at her by a slave owner as a child and was left with headaches and, and apparent seizures. But also it seems a kind of a heightened intuition um, with um, God or the divine a, as she would see it. And her, um, her spirituality to me seemed what I would call mystical. Um, when I was a teenager, I used to read, uh, uh, you know, about Teresa of Avila or St. Therese of Lisieux or Julian of Norwich, and they had a very imminent kind of sensual experience, a very direct experience of the divine and reading about Harriet Tubman. That's what it reminded me of. Now, now you and I know others have, have suggested that she may actually have been left with um, epileptic seizures from a result of that head injury. So whatever the source, I wonder if you could talk to us about the relationship that Harriet Tubman had with God, with the divine, and, and what role you think that played in her extraordinary courage and ability. So um, she was a deeply, deeply faithful person, very spiritual, and the roots of that spiritual life of hers, I think, is rooted not only in... Um, Christian-based uh, faith traditions that she was raised with, different, uh, you know, the Baptists or Episcopalian or Methodist, um, but also, you know, West African traditions that were handed mm -hmm. down in the Black community. Um, so, but after her head injury, and I, I'd like to keep that sort of separate, certainly she survived the injury, she had epileptic seizures for the rest of her life as a result of that injury, but her faith kind of fortified her mm. and guided her through those moments when she was powerless, when she'd have a seizure. And she would wake up and feel, um, you know, that God had protected her. And yeah. actually, from that moment on, she believed that God protected her and that mm. she had a purpose. And um, I don't think we can argue with that because certainly she was, you know, confronted with some incredible obstacles and frightening uh, experiences and she survived yeah, them yeah. but she believed when she'd have those seizures she would hear voices she'd hear singing she mm -hmm. believed that god was speaking to her directly mm -hmm. and um it comforted her and it might have frightened people around her when she'd have a seizure but she felt very confident that god was protecting her mm -hmm. and that gave her courage mm -hmm. well and and she lived until i think it was mm -hmm. 1912 um, 13, yeah. 1913. Yes, so um, one could make an argument. No, actually, you know, uh, uh, when I read that she had died in 1913, it, it made me think about how recent actually slavery was and how recent yeah. the end of it was. Because my father was born in 1914, just a year after go. she died. So anyway, um, well, that was very helpful and very interesting. Thank you, Kate, for that. Uh, you know, um, you mentioned that her motivation was driven in large part by the love that she felt for friends and family and uh, how much she wanted them to be able to escape slavery. And, and she was determined to end slavery. She appears to me to have had uh, what I would call a visionary moral sense and intelligence, which manifests in Harriet Tubman like a superpower, um, you know, the clarity of her vision, um, and which prompted her to escape and then to help others to freedom. But that wasn't all that she did in her lifetime. And your biography helps to fill in some of her um, lesser known, uh, but no less courageous and strategic work as a guide and a scout for the Union Army, 
um, some of which is shown in the film. Um, but I was hoping that you might also fill us in on some of the lesser known chapters of her relentless activism of, uh, on behalf of people recovering from having been enslaved and her, also her advocacy for women's suffrage um, in the later decades of her life. Um, so she lived in a very segregated, um, bigoted world, <clears throat> even when she was free. So when she settled in Auburn, New York, after the Civil War, she purchased a, a farm, a seven acre farm from William Henry Seward, uh, Lincoln Secretary of State. And he, um, she welcomed anyone into her home. She was an incredible humanitarian and she, uh, her door was open to the homeless, to the sick, to the disabled, orphans. And so that was continuing her service um, to people and not just African-Americans, but white people too. But generally she recognized that, that African-Americans didn't have access to the resources, financial or physical resources that white people had. And to that end, she, her dream for decades had been to open a home for the aged. And eventually she was able to do that at the turn of the century. She was also an early advocate for women's rights naturally. And um, she started in Boston in, in the 1850s, giving talks at women's rights meetings and things like that. And she was a constant reminder to white women that black women like her deserve the vote too. And to yeah, remind yeah. men, you know, she fought during the Civil War. She was a veteran. She viewed herself as a veteran. She deserved to vote. She had fought for freedom yeah. and equality and she deserved it too. And audiences really were drawn to her when she stood up there and advocated for equal rights. Yeah, in, in, your, in, in your book, you talk about um, what an effective speaker she was. Um, and I was hoping you might tell us a little bit more about what made her so effective. What's your sense of what her presence was like in front of a group that made her so effective in engaging people? So first of all, she was petite. She was five feet tall. She was a tiny little person. And when she would get on the stage and they, or she would be introduced and people would talk about what courageous things she had done or she would talk about them herself, it was incredible to, for people to see this little woman who had no formal education being able to execute all this yeah. great work. And um, she had a very, she was so authentic and people craved authenticity at the time. Mm. And so um, she was very effective. And she, she was very poetic when she talked. She almost spoke in, like she was a poet and the things that she would say were so vivid. She could bring the battlefield to the audience. Wow. She could bring those scary moments along the Underground Railroad to the audience. Um, so that's what made her a very effective uh, speaker. Mm. I, I, can, I can only, we can only imagine it literally. Don't you wish sometimes that there had been YouTube <laughs> yes. available yes. to record it? Because <laughs> uh, I have the feeling it would translate across the, across the decades. I think so, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I do want to ask you about your work as a consultant on the 2019 award-winning excellent film, Harriet. Um, what is the role of a consultant on a historically based film uh, like Harriet? And, and I was curious to find out also what was satisfying about you to that role and what might have been frustrating for you about it. Um, so the role of a consultant is to help uh, for a historical based film is to help um, the directors and producers at least try to adhere to some semblance of the real history. Mm. Um, but when you're trying to pack a story into two hours and it's Hollywood and there's drama, um, things, they, they have to cut corners and they have yeah. to they have these formulas about how many characters you can have and they all can't have the same name. And so it, it was hard for me to adjust to that. But I mm -hmm. really, what was the great thing about it was working with Casey Lemons, the mm -hmm. director who was working on the script and the producers, Deborah Chase. And um, it was just uh, an incredible experience. They respected my opinion mm -hmm. and they valued my opinion. They didn't always uh, use it. But um, I felt that they really made the effort to make the film authentic. Mm -hmm. Now, while everything in the film is not accurate to Harriet Tubman, it is accurate to somebody during that time period. Uh, so they sort of okay. conflated stories of different people into the package. 
Um, but it is a very authentic Harriet Tubman, very authentic. I thought uh, Cynthia Revo nailed mm -hmm. Tubman's personality and courage and sense of humor as well. Mm -hmm. Tubman had a great sense of humor. So I, 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 it was a great experience for me. I, oh. I, there was no downside to it for me. I just, I really am grateful that they asked me to come on board and, and work with them. Oh, I'm so glad that it was a good experience for you. I mean, and it was an amazing film. It really was um, mm -hmm. harrowing and uplifting at the same time. Um, and Cynthia Erivo was just astonishingly good, I thought. Mm -hmm. And she's such a good fit because part of the way that um, Tubman would communicate was through singing and through hymns. Mm -hmm. And to get Cynthia Reaver to do the singing, I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you know, uh, Kate, you mentioned, of course, in a, in a, in a two-hour film, that's a lot of history to kind of shrink. Uh, and um, and that there's a necessary amount of compression in, involved. Um, there was one pivotal scene, though, that really stayed with me that I wanted to ask you about um, and get your sense of what was authentic about it and your interpretation of, of the importance of that film. Um, so there's a scene um, when the character Gideon, Burdess, um, has been hunting Harriet. And uh, she gets the better of him, and he's on his knees in front of her, and she's got a gun pointed at his head. But he continues to plead with her that, uh, oblivious to the fact that she's got a gun at his head, <laughs> that she should just come with him. She should surrender and come with him. And he seems nearly delusional to me when you watch that scene. It's like, wait a minute, buddy. She's got a gun pointed at your head, and yet he keeps talking, and he won't shut up, and he keeps saying, and until um, finally, uh, um, Harriet Tubman's character says to him, people can't own people. And it, it isn't so much that the character of Gideon doesn't agree with her. It seems as though this idea just cannot and does not penetrate his consciousness. Um, he's so certain that he has a claim on ownership, that she is his property, and that he just keeps talking and she will submit to him. Um, so that scene just stood out to me um, and uh, stayed with me. And I was curious to ask you, um, was that a scene that you consulted on? And, and what is your interpretation of it? So I think you interpreted it really well. I think it is a powerful scene. Gideon is a slaveholder through and through. Um, he's a made up character. There wasn't a Brodus son that was that age, but that's beside the point. He stands in for slaveholders yeah. and their attitude that it's their divine right, their God given right to enslave people and mm -hmm. dominate them. And, um, so I thought the scene was played out beautifully. As I recall, I think in the script, they were talking about having her kill him. Mm. Um, but uh, she, and, and also having her kill um, the black slave catcher too. Yeah. But we, we, we got it pulled back and, and I think it ended up being much more powerful because mm -hmm. yeah. those words, people don't own people, can't. Yeah. People. It's just, it's yeah. so powerful. And she he rises above and the, the yes. angle of the camera, she's standing yeah. above him and it's yes. just powerful, right. really powerful. It was very powerful. And again, I think not having her kill him maintains her, you know, her, her morality really was her superpower. And it stays <laughs> consistent with that then. So, well, anyway, thank you. Because that scene just has, it still stays with me. I still think about it. Yeah. Um, so um, there was another phrase in your book that really struck me and stayed with me. At one point, you began talking about the phrase, the usable past. And that just struck me. Wait a minute, the usable past. So I looked it up <laughs> and I found out that, yeah. I mean, I've come to an appreciation for history later on in life, but I realized, you know, historians talk about this all the time. <laughs> it's not news to anybody who's ever studied history. And it relates to the idea that history isn't the truth or even the facts. Um, history is subject to ownership, uh, which changes over time. And as you point out in the book, um, the ownership of history is political, intellectual, and emotional. And I I've been wanting to ask you about that ever since um, because it's so relevant uh, to what's happening um, today 
regarding the cavernous gaps in so many Americans' knowledge of our racial history. So I was hoping you could teach us more about who owned the history of the Civil War and slavery, especially how the glory of the lost cause, as they call it, and mourning for the old South, or what people often refer to as our heritage, came to overshadow the narrative of the actual horror of slavery that brought vast wealth to plantation owners uh, and was brutally protected uh, by the old South. Right. Um, it's a really complicated story, but in a, <clears throat> in a little nutshell, after the Civil War was over and after the federal government was no longer occupying the South, the federal government had to occupy the Southern states because they were taking out anger and frustration on their formerly enslaved people. There was all, uh, you know, hangings and, and um, abuse going on and they wanted to ensure that African Americans had the right to vote and live independent lives. And for them. Um, but the, the that was called the Reconstruction. And after that, over in 1877, the South basically was free to sort of relave uh, African Americans through share crime, tenancy, and poor pay, et cetera, and denying them the right to vote. Yeah. So, um, and then this narrative, the nation was desperate to heal its wounds of the war, this, the um, divided nation. They wanted to bring everybody back together. So, um, there was a tacit agreement to not talk about the real reason of the war, and that was over slavery. South wanted to maintain slavery. Northern states that were expanding into the West didn't want to be there. So that just disappeared. African Americans lost their voice, not only their vote, but their voice as well. And, um, you know, white people were probably willing to forget the tragedy and the reasons for the war in the first place. And so with all these commemorations of um, Confederate treason, uh, treasonous uh, people who yeah. fought against the United States of America, and that was allowed to flourish, particularly in the 20th century. It just became much more powerful and with the establishment of lots of these monuments, and our history books failed. I mean, we've got to re-examine how it's being taught in high school yeah. uh, because Americans are not really aware of the true history and we need to embrace it and talk about it yeah. and, um, and correct what the myths have been all about this, this long time. Yeah, it, it's particularly interesting to me because I, my family moved from Michigan to Northern Virginia when I was starting seventh grade. And my seventh grade Virginia history book was one of the ones that was actually featured in the 1619 project, um, uh. which was, a, it was a, it was a, total kind of cover up of the horrors of slavery. And I remember even at the age of 12 thinking, wait a minute, they were happy with their, you know, their benevolent masters. Anything that has the word master in it, you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not buying it. So it was really interesting to me to come across the concept of the usable past and how that was usable to um, the North um, at the time. Now, so something has shifted, though, uh, with Harriet Tubman. Um, some I wanted to ask you about um, the smoothing of the edges and the marginalizing of the history of the impact of slavery. How did that impact what we knew or didn't know about Harriet Tubman and how she was being written about and for what kinds of audiences? So what I discovered was that... Um the way she was portrayed, particularly um, through those early biographies, was that, yes, she was brave and courageous, but isn't that sweet? And she was portrayed with a very thick plantation dialect, and those early books have many racist words in them. Um, and they didn't tell, they didn't fully respect her full life. Mm -hmm. um, in the 20th century, there was just an explosion of children's books about Tubman, and they're very sweet, and they're, um, they're just not authentic when it comes to the real brilliance of this woman. It was yeah. like, let's, let's tone her down. She wasn't really that smart. She couldn't read or write. And um, so that is the great tragedy during the 20th century. Um, but after the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s, and there was more literature that was more accurate coming out about African Americans in the past, um, and children's books began to reflect that. And it, particularly in the 20th century, the children, children's books are much more authentic and give 
Tubman the credit that she deserves and the power mm -hmm. and intelligence that she had. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it seems to me that every American today owes a huge debt of gratitude to Harriet Tubman um, for her work to end slavery and also to create equality for women. She should have a holiday, in my opinion, her own holiday. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think in a new administration, she'll probably make it on to, I think it's the $20 bill yes, that, that yes, they proposed for her. So. And I'm pretty confident that within a few years, you know, hopefully soon, <laughs> yes. she'll make it onto the $20 bill. And, um, I'm glad that your biography came out and the film came out and apparently Harriet Tubman's history is usable now, which is something is. to celebrate, isn't it? It is. Yes, it is. So, it is. you know, you're a biographer and so you spend a lot of time with every aspect of Harriet Tubman's life. So I'm figuring you know her as well as anyone in the present could know somebody from the past. I was curious to ask you, do you have a sense of how she would respond to what's happening in the US uh, around the Black Lives Matter protests, around uh, you know racial injustice? What, what would she be doing right now? Well, she'd be protesting, she'd be carrying signs, she'd be telling everybody to wear a mask, and she would be pulling down <laughs> She would be pulling down those monuments to Confederate traitors, too. She would yeah. be right up there. She would not be afraid at all. She would be challenging the status quo every single minute of her mm -hmm. life. Yeah. yeah. Not surprised to hear that. And she would be able to provide testimony about why, no, you know, Calhoun doesn't deserve a statue, or let me exactly. tell you about the real Andrew Jackson. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and we would listen raptly. Well, um, Kate, you're a writer and, his, and an historian, and, and in my perhaps limited experience, uh, but still, um, writers and historians, to my knowledge, are always working on something. <laughs> and so I wonder if you could tell us what you're working on right now. I am working on a biography of civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who came to um, the national stage during the 1960s. And she, in my mind, is another Harriet Tubman, mm. only 100 years later. She is a remarkable woman who came out of nowhere, and she really changed the world with her drive for freedom and equality and standing up to authority at great risk to her own life. And um, mm -hmm. she is a tremendous inspiration. And I, I can't wait to finish this book because everyone in the world should know about her. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm so glad. I mean, I know the name. I've certainly heard it before. And in mm -hmm. my mind, it's, you know, civil rights activists, but there's so much more to be told, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And to hear that you place her with Harriet Tubman is very yeah. exciting. So I hope you will consider yourself pre-booked uh, to come back to <laughs> the morning you. show um, and, and teach us about um, what you discover uh, about Fannie Lou Hamer and to uh, uh, talk to us about the book that you've written. Thank um, you. I know we were talking before that, you know, you were hoping to be able to go to Mississippi and the pandemic has kind of disrupted the flow of that, but we'll all hope that you're able to get there as soon as possible um, and get to work on that. Thank so, you. Um, Kate, thank you so much for visiting the morning show. It's been an honor to talk to you and, and, you know, thank you for writing a full-fledged grown-up biography of Harriet Tubman. I recommend it to everybody. Anybody who's seen the film and wants to know more about Harriet Tubman, you'll find all of the, all of the questions answered in Kate's uh, biography. It reads like a novel. Her life was extraordinary and rich and full. Um, there was one more thing I realized I wanted to ask you. There's a photograph of Tubman in the last year of her life. Um, and it's also kind of haunting. You'll know the one I mean. She's kind of shrouded in white like a veil and a, do you, that, the, and it's, it's an extraordinary photograph. If you get the book, get the book and then look up this photograph because she looks to me as though she's looking out into another world already. And I just wonder if yeah. you have any more, um, can you tell me anything more about that photograph and, and why you chose that one and if it had the same impact on you that it had on me? Um, it's a fantastic photograph. It was taken the year before she died and she's sitting in a wheelchair. Actually, she yeah. couldn't walk anymore. And it's in front of the John Brown Hall, which was a, a sort oh. of a nursing home that she established for African Americans so that they could have good health care, free health care. Yeah. Um, and so, but she still has that steely resolve. And yeah. if you look at her hands, her hands are still powerful. Um, I just see a very powerful woman in the last year of her life still yeah. gazing out and ha still has much to do. And her legacy clearly is living on through that, that photograph.
It clearly is because it, it, it really is an extraordinary photograph. And I just, I've spent some amount of time just staring at that photograph because I feel like if I stare at it long enough, it might change me. <laughs> <laughs> we can all hope so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kate. It's just been an Thank honor you. to talk to you. I really appreciate your visiting the morning show and you are absolutely invited back to teach us more about Fannie Lou Hamer. Thank, Thank you, Mary. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we're going to bring on our next guest now. I'm delighted to welcome um, local historian Jack Santos, who is here to talk about the If This House Could Talk version um, for the, uh, the 2020 pandemic version, I guess we could call it, of If This House Could Talk, which was always one of my very most favorite um, activities associated with Yankee Homecoming in which local homeowners can do research on their house and then uh, put it together on a poster and uh, we can walk, you can walk around uh, and read about people's houses. And I'm wondering, Lily, can we get Jack and Barb and Sharon on camera now? And uh, Jack Santos is here. And uh, he's joined by Barb Bailey, who is with the Newburyport Preservation Trust. Welcome, Barb. Welcome, Jack. And Sharon Spieldener is here as well. And she is the important job. She is the archivist at the Newburyport Public Library. So hi, welcome, Sharon. So glad to have hi. all of you here. Good morning. So Jack, I was just saying, I'm so glad you're doing a version of If This House Could Talk, because in past years with Yankee Homecoming, I have just loved walking around and learning um, sometimes quite surprising things to me, and it seems in some cases to the homeowners as well, about the uh, historic homes in Newburyport. So Jack, I would like to start by asking you if you could tell us, how did you decide to go ahead and invent a 2020 pandemic version of If This House Could Talk in the absence of of Yankee homecoming this year? Oh, you know, like all decisions this year, it was a difficult and gut-wrenching one. Because you know, I'm kind of older, I'm at risk. I don't want to be walking around with people maybe bumping into them. And we were we were all sitting around saying, should we do it, should we not do it? <laughs> Yankee homecoming is off. And then finally, in the end, we said, this is probably the best pandemic version, you know, thing to do. You yeah, need to walk it's around. outside. <laughs> outside, you take personal responsibility to stay six feet away, you wear a mask. Uh, so even though you know, y Yankee Homecoming is kind of scaled back on everything it's doing, yeah. they're, they're doing the food bank, which is really good, and we don't want to ignore that. But uh, but uh, we said, let's take the same week and have people put out the signs. And uh, so far, the uh, you know the reception for that decision has been great. The city said, oh, go ahead. Health department said go ahead glee woodworth led the charge and making sure we're not getting anybody mad by doing it so good thank thank you glee and uh so we're really looking forward to it this year you got all the important players at work then that's great wonderful well um jack what will be uh the same this year and is there anything that will be different aside from the masks well, I, I just wanted to point out, I have samples of signs behind Great. me, uh, so people kind of get a feel if they hadn't seen it. And it's amazing how many people are in Newburyport that still sit this, say, you know, I kind of heard about it, or oh. every year I want to do it, and I haven't done it yet, so maybe this year I'll do it. So it, I, I don't think there's a heck of a lot that's going to be different uh, in mm -hmm. that it's still kind of grassroots. People are yeah. going to create the signs. They're going to put them up. We're not going to give them a lot of direction on what the do if they want to put you know earlier in the pandemic we had the uh, you know the front door jokes uh thing if that's what they want to do go for it put up put up a front door joke on your side but the, you know the intent is to, to focus on the house and the history and the people that lived in it you know what's going to be different it's going to be family now you know, we're not going to have all these strangers walking around the street. It's got to be, you know, Joe Schmo and Sally Sue from down the street that you never had a chance to talk to. And they're going to be walking around and all the people that would leave their Yankee homecoming and say, I'm getting the heck out of town. I can't stand <laughs> the crowds. They're going to be yes. here. They're going to be right. Awesome. <laughs> Ride your bike. You won't have to worry about parking. Yeah, you're right. It's yeah. going to be a real community building event then. That's really great. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, who can participate? Uh, anybody can. 
really. I mean, you, you've got a house, even if you're renting, uh, even if you're in the West End, even if you're in P Maudsley, or anybody can. You know, it started kind of in the South End uh, five years ago, and then it's kept expanding to the to the North End. And we've got a fair amount of houses. We get over 100 every year. We'll see how many we get this year. Uh, so if you want to participate, you go to mapme.walk, Newberry Report, you know, W-A-L-K, Newberry Report, it's all one word, uh, Dot com and you can put your address in. You can look at the map at map.walknewbyreport. Uh, and even the walknewbyreport.com website has all these articles and things to do and how to do it. So, yeah, that, I'm encouraging, you know, kids, families, just just do it. Wonderful. Anybody can do it then. It doesn't, your, your house doesn't have to be a certain age. Oh, no. You know, it, it's funny. I, I'm going to let you in on a secret, Mary. Okay. Go My ahead. usual spiel when people ask me what made you start this is like, well, I was walking around my, my uh, stepson in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Port. They were doing it. And uh, I thought this would be great for Newberry Port. And finally, we got around to doing it. That's not really why I do it. And I think your first. <laughs> okay, we're going to get the truth now. <laughs> yeah, your first speaker hit, hit the nail on the head. And it's such a good time. This is about culture change. Mm -hmm. This is all the same reasons we're th rethinking racism and we're rethinking the police and their mission. And we're rethinking, you know, what's, uh, uh, what, what's a fact? How do we do schools? Th this is about rethinking our homes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and it's not only what's what uh, the you know the stories about the homes, but the stories about the people in yeah. the homes. So, uh, I think it's a it just fits in with the times where we're questioning everything. Uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll I'll encourage folks. And we had a home here in the South End just recently. It was a big brew uh, on Facebook, where the the owner bought the home. They tore it down. Everybody expected them to rehab it. They didn't for a, a, a lot of good reasons. It was too far gone. And mm -hmm. there was you know two camps: the people that hated that uh, he did that, and the people that said leave him alone. You know, property mm -hmm. owners' rights. I'll encourage him to put a sign up. You know, put a sign up that explains the history of the house that was torn down and why he had to put it up. And what's he doing to try to keep the same kind of, you know, aura and uh, similarity to the neighborhood? Because he has a great story to tell. So even yeah. even that would, would be a great if this house could talk sign. Oh, absolutely. Weave that narrative. Uh, absolutely. And let people know. I, I agree with you 100%. That's a great idea. And, uh, and yes, having read some of the posters in past years, it's some of the some of the soap operas are part of the most, you know, the architecture, you know, aside just the stories of the families and who lived there. And uh, people sometimes discovering I remember in one house that they actually were related to some of the people who had lived there a long time ago, and they weren't even aware of it. So well, let's bring Barb and Sharon in on this because they deal with some of the research aspects of it. So Barb, um, could you tell us about your work with the Preservation Trust? And I believe you have some Zoom classes that you'll be offering homeowners. So could you tell us about those classes, what people will learn and how people can sign up? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Mary, for uh, having us on today. Um, so I am a researcher for the Newburyport Preservation Trust Historic House Plaque Program. And uh, so I use the um, primary source documents that are available digitally or going to the library to see Sharon and uh, use the archival center. And uh, so I use all those sources to help me date houses and who built those houses. Yeah. And um, so for If This House Could Talk, I'm offering a couple of Zoom uh, classes. We already held one, uh, which was, mm. it was, it went really well. It was great. Uh, so we have another one coming up on July 1st at 1 p.m. And the other one is July 12th at 7 p.m. And um, basically, I go through um, my research process. And I'll share all of the uh, resources that I use, primarily Salem Deeds, um, and showing how the website works and how to find information about your house. Um, and then hopefully, people can take that process and uh, start to learn more about their house. Hmm. And uh, as, as Jack said, also the people who live in the house, too. So um, really looking forward to that. You can sign up for the class at uh, research.walknewburyport.com. Did I get that right, Jack? Yep. <laughs> Barb, could you move the mic a little closer to your mouth and then repeat that? 
I think okay. the, the volume is a little low, so. Okay, sorry about that. That's better, yeah. Okay, so, so it's uh, research.walknewburyport.com. That's much better, thank you, sorry Barb. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. This is this is Zoom. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, <laughs> but there are I've coined the term Zoom stakes. <laughs> so yeah, that sounds like a great resource for anybody who's interested in doing this to take those Zoom classes. Barb, thank you so much. And I guess the other critical player here, Sharon, um, is you uh, being the archivist um, at the Newburyport Public Library. So you could you tell us about the resources available through the libraries? archives of what kind of assistance you provide people. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so we are um, part of the Newburyport Public Library. We're located in the lower level of the library. Um, we have all kinds of materials um, to help pe patrons with their um, house history. Um, we have all kinds of um, maps um, that are very detailed maps. And I actually mm. have here. I don't know if you can see it. But um, we have an 1851 map, an 1870. Oh up in an 1884 map that shows you the footprint of a building and who owned it, oh. proprietor's name. Um, it's upside down, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> that the main point is you have the maps from different periods of time. <laughs> so people can see the footprint, the changing footprint, the neighborhood right. changes the neighborhood and also get information about who owned their house then. Um, yep. So yeah. yeah and that's, a good, that's a good starting place. Um, we have directories from 1849 all the way up to present and that can you can trace the people that live there and how long they might have lived there um, there's all kinds of wonderful information in the city directories it tells you um, where they worked what their occupation was um, where they live yeah. they could live in two different places or they could live at the business um, also tell you if they passed away that year or if they moved to another town there's just a chock full of information and if there's sure. So the human story is available through those resources too. Now, right. the library is not open though. So maybe you could talk to people right. about how they gain access to the archive resources and to you. Right. So we, um, we, we are happy to help people with their research. Um, that's what we do down here. Um, we um, encourage people to call or to go to our website and email us. Um, the email, uh, this is our website here. So let's read that. This will be on the radio as well as YouTube, www.newburyportpl.org. There you go. Right. And you can um, email us there and send us in any, any questions you might have, and we can help mm -hmm. you with that. Um, we have all kinds of resources that are available online. Um, we have our Newburyport newspapers from 1773 up to 1963. Um, wow. Digitally, and you can do keywords. Wow. Um, it's amazing how much information you can get on your house for that. Um, I bet you can learn all kinds of things about the people who learned in your house <laughs> by having access digitally to those newspapers. That's a great resource. And of course, oh, that's wonderful. on our website as well. Yeah, that's really great. So there's a lot of resources available for people who are intrigued by this idea. I wanted to ask each of you, um, what do you enjoy most about your involvement with If This House Could Talk? Whoever would like to start. Jack, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'll chime in. The, um, you know, it's it's the end of July. It's the doldrums of the yeah. summer. <laughs> it, it's you know, the uh, usually you have your hanky homecoming, and you know that kind of breaks things up. But what I really enjoy is besides going to the beach and loafing off, it it's, <laughs> gives me something to do. And then I get to meet my neighbors, and I get to walk around the street and get some exercise, which my doctor is always on top of me about. So this is all good. Yeah, so I, that's that's the great thing about the if this house could talk. It hits on a lot of points. It is, and you know, let's be honest. It's a lot more constructive than decorating your dog with pieces of bread and then putting them on TikTok or YouTube or whatever. People have been finding all, all kinds of, of ways to entertain themselves. So, um, Barb, what about you? What do you enjoy the most about it? Um, I, I think what I like best is it builds a sense of community um, yeah. and that we are all together. Um, I know many of my neighbors have put out signs and I just love walking down the street and reading those. And then as I walk around town, I just, I feel like it brings us together um, yeah. as one community in this, in this great city of Newburyport. 
It is a great city. And I know for me, it just creates, it's funny, a, a sense of connection with the Newburyport, Newbury, like the ghost of Christmas past, present and future, <laughs> kind of like with the ghost of Newburyport past, it creates that sense of connection. And then we're in the present and then you can fantasize about the future. So yeah, it really is a community building exercise. Well, Sharon, what about you? What do you enjoy the most about it? I think I like the fact that it sparks creativity, like yeah. any goes. So some people really go all out and they make little wooden signs of, and, and replicas of their mm. house and they have little windows and they put lights in the windows and, let it... <laughs> and then you see people um, adding to their signs over the years because they, they, they'll tell the story about the architectural history in yeah. the first year, and then the next year they'll add stories about the people. So it's kind of, it's fun that way and you learn a lot. You know, that's one of the problems. That's that's a side effect of this house could talk, sign envy. Somebody puts up a great <laughs> sign, you go, oh, I should have done that. That looks really good. <laughs> well, let's hope they put that energy to constructive use in, in <laughs> being created, even more creative the next year. And I'm guessing or hoping that maybe with a lot of the extra time people have on their hands, that maybe there'll be a lot of really, really creative signs. I'm a great fan of outdoor lights myself, so maybe there'll be more people adding those. I'm curious to find out, what about, what do you hear from some of the people who have researched their houses? What, what do you hear from people? people about the positive impacts that they report that it's had on them to do the research? So yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, I think that um, people feel like they're stewards of their home and so uh, they find, and again, it's, it goes back to that connection and they can, um, they can visualize the people who used to live there or, you know, what room did this happen in? Or, um, oh, there was a funeral held at my house. I wonder where that would have been. Um, and so there's definitely a connection to those people in the past and, and yeah. also a, a pride of wanting to continue that legacy for future generations. Yeah, yeah. That sounds very positive and very impactful. Yeah, um, you know, I, I have to add on to that. I, I just feel I'm living an old house built around 1789. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, I'm just a steward. You know, I'm here, <laughs> one of a long line yeah. of folks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up one of my signs because I found this for last year's, last year's size. So that's a portrait of Jeremiah Wilwright. Uh -huh. who lived oh. in this house uh, 1820. His father owned the house. His father moved up to Brigham Manor. He decided to move into my house, uh, brought up his kids here, and then was lost at sea in a shipwreck off the coast oh, of my. Virginia in 1830. Oh. And I had no idea that this, this uh, painting of him existed until I met the family. They had heard that I was doing research on their family, and they introduced themselves, and they said, you know, there's a portrait of him down in uh, storage in Virginia. I have yet to see it, but I was actually able to get kind of a photocopy of what the portrait looked like. But uh, I think about Jeremiah all the time and his kids. One of them went on to found his great great grandson went out went on to uh, found polaroid so oh no kidding that's a great story jack it really <laughs> is so folks that's the kind of story you might stumble across if you start researching your house because a lot of houses in new report go back really really far <laughs> so sharon was there anything you wanted to add about what people have said to you about the impact on them of doing the research well, I, there was a young man from, who was a middle school student that came in and um, he was working on a school project at that time and he saw the maps that we had and he picked out his house on each map and he told, he recounted the whole history of his um, house that his mother had done all the research on and uh -huh. he decided to share it with us, you know, so, <laughs> so that's kind of a neat aspect, you know, that people share the information and then it gets passed on. And you get a young, young historian in the making there, which is a wonderful thing. Historians yep. have so much to add. <laughs> yep. So anyway, well, tell us when will the poster start going up? July 26. Okay, right July at the 26 beginning. July 26th to August 2nd. Uh, in fact, what we found in prior years, people kind of, they get impatient. They start putting them up early. Some leave them up all summer. It's really kind of kind of funny. So, you know, it's, anything goes. Well, the biggest barrier I have when I started this thing is people said, oh, it's a walking tour, right? So, well, not really. <laughs> oh, you're going you're gonna to tell me how to do the sign. What kind of font do you want it in? I said, uh, just write whatever. It's up to you. It's really up to whatever a person wants to do. And if they want to keep it up all year, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. yeah. You can use your own creativity. So 
<laughs> well, one more time, um, would you repeat the information about the website where people can get information about uh, if this house could talk? Sure. Well, it's easy. It's, you know, it's what you would be doing. Walknewberryport.com. Perfect. <laughs> That's the website. And from there, it spins off to a lot of different resources. It's written up research.walknewberryport gets you to the class sign up. Map.walknewberryport gets you to the map. And mapme.walknewberryport has you put in your street address if you're going to participate so people can find you. Uh, you know, we all like serendipity and just walk around and stumble on them, but some of us like to be more planned than how right. they really decide. <laughs> so they love the map. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, Jack, Barb, and Sharon, thank you so much. I'm so really delighted that there will be an If This House Could Talk um, this year, and I'm looking forward to it, and I'll be looking up that map. Um, so thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you on the morning show. Thank you. Uh, it's been a real joy to have you here, and thanks for sharing all that information. So, Thanks for having us, Mary. Oh, my Spot pleasure. Mary. Absolutely. Take care now. So that's it for today's morning show, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you'll join us next Thursday on the morning show when I'm very excited to host a discussion for families about how to talk with children about race and racism. I'm honored to have two experts on with me to talk about this important and timely subject. Dr. Cabria Baumgarten will be here. She teaches African American Studies and Women's Studies at the University of New Hampshire. And Erin Seaton will be here as well. She's a senior lecturer in the education school at Tufts. We will also have, uh, toward the end of the hour, Vicki Henderson, who will be here to talk about the um, numerous and diverse offerings available to you virtually throughout the summer from Newburyport Adult and Community Education. If you missed part of today's show, it will be available for viewing on the Port Media YouTube channel, playlist for the morning show. Just go to www.ncmhubhub.org and click on the YouTube icon, then look for the playlist for the morning show. Each show will also air on WJ. JOPLP New Report FM 96.3 on Friday tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and then again the following Tuesday at 4 p.m. and Wednesday at 3 p.m. and then it will be available as a podcast on the SoundCloud. Just click on the cloud icon again at www.ncmhub.org and scroll down. My thanks to our producer for the day today, Lily Desette, who made everything run very smoothly. Thank you for that. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful week, and we'll look forward to seeing you back uh, the morning show next Thursday morning at 9. Bye now.